<laughs> Great. <laughs> Hello, everyone. It's fantastic to be here. Um, my name is Ewan McHenry. Uh, I am an ecologist with the Woodland Trust and formerly a PhD student at Aberdeen University, which is where I began this piece of work as a bit of a side project, working along with uh, Matthew Nuttall, who formerly worked with SSRS, along with my supervisor, Zabe Lambin. Um, we worked also along with another, an honor student that came along and worked with us, George Porton, fantastic young man who um, did a kind of a sponsored internship following his undergraduate to work on an analysis of uh, trapping data from the spring surf, not, not trapping data, survey data from the spring surveys. Um, I've, been, I've been taking on this analysis kind of on the side a bit over the last few, well, it's come years now. Um, Emma Sheehy approached me whenever I unfortunately mentioned to her that I've been doing this work and uh, she strong armed me to giving a presentation. Um, so I'm filling this as a, a glance over my shoulder as I uh, work to squeeze as much possible useful information out of the uh, spring surveys as possible. Uh, and I've given this subtitle of what does it mean when we don't spot any squirrels? So about occupancy and detection. And oh, the great of my screen changed. There we go. Yes. So the uh, spring survey, as has already been mentioned in several talks today, but well, I might as well repeat it, uh, is run by many volunteers over two kilometer tetrads thrown across the over the shoulder of uh, ecologists randomly, let's say, uh, across Scotland in four different regions in the northeast, Tayside, Argyll and Trussex and southern Scotland. Um, there's three or four feeder boxes in each of these tetrads, and they're visited, I think it's three times a year, about two weeks apart, by volunteers who gather detection or non-detection data based on the detections of um, errors from grey and red squirrels, and also occasionally detect pine marten. It's a, it's a very cool data set as a, as a quantitative ecologist who's very geeky about, about these things. Um, but it really does beg the question, what do non-detections mean? So we can plot through time the um, proportion of sites each year that have given us a positive or negative detection for both red and gray squirrels. Reds, well, red squirrels are red and gray squirrels are this lovely gray blue color there along the bottom for each of the different regions. Um, but th this, I mean, to look at, to look at this essentially assumes 100% detectability. You assume that if you go to one of these tetrads and do a survey, and there are squirrels there, you assume that you detect them. Um, and that can be okay if detection probability is constant, uh, if it doesn't change depending on the weather or depending on which squirrel species are present, um, and if it's very high as well. If you have really high detection probabilities, maybe you don't need to worry so much about detection probability. And this analysis I did essentially was to take a look at that. Um, I used this framework called occupancy modeling. Now there's a lot of text in the screen, I wouldn't really worry about it. But essentially, it's about assuming, not trying to get away from this assumption where you assume that you detect everything that's there. And you can estimate the detection probability. I wouldn't worry about it too much, but essentially, whenever I go to a site, say I can volunteer goes to a site and doesn't detect a squirrel, it's not necessarily absent of squirrels. It, it can be viewed as a coin spinning in the air that might fall on occupied by squirrels and might fall unoccupied. What you do is you go along and you do repeated observations of the same thing. So you look at these sites multiple times, just like the spring surveys do. They go back three times every year and look at it. And if you assume that the true occupancy doesn't change within those three surveys, you can learn something from the pattern of the detections and non-detections you get. So maybe you detect in all three surveys, maybe you detect just in the first one and then none of the rest, or maybe you don't detect any at all. Uh, and you can use these patterns of non-detections and detections to estimate what the detection probability is, because if you detect something at least once, then you know that the truth is that, that site is occupied. So those zeros give you information about how difficult it is to detect something given that it's there. But the point here I'm trying to make is you can, you can estimate and account for this imperfect detection process. And that's cool. I mean, it allows you to be much more rigorous in um, your assertions of what percentage of sites are occupied by red or gray squirrels. And it also allows you to dig in to the processes that impact, that actually affect these occupancy dynamics. What 
what drives the colonization of sites by different squirrel species, which impacts the two species have on each other, what makes it more or less likely to detect something whenever it's there. Um, and all, the, all this, these kind of questions are the questions that can obviously drive more effective management. And if we can answer them in a rigorous way, then we can take management based on good rigorous evidence. And that's always a good thing, particularly if you've just got some hobbyist who's interested to do a bit of analysis. Anyway, the model itself. Um, so the, the spring survey started off in 2013. Uh, so we can say, okay, in 2013, sites are either occupied or not occupied by red or gray squirrels, and then they were surveyed. And the sites that are surveyed, the sites that are, are occupied, they can either be detected or not. And then in every following year, sites that were detected, in the, with the sites that were occupied in the previous year can either go extinct, and sites that weren't occupied can be colonized. And then you've got this detection process, which goes over the top and tries to tell you where the squirrels are. It's imperfect. Um, and yeah, essentially, this allows you to estimate that where, which sites are occupied, which sites are coming ex becoming extinct, which empty sites are being colonized, and how easy it is to detect squirrels given that they are in the site. Uh, and well, how, how good are we at detecting them? That's probably the first big question. I like, I like this figure because it kind of instills a healthy amount of competition between the different regions. Uh, see here, Argyll and the Trussex, Northeast, so Southern Scotland and Tayside, and there are relative detection probabilities for each of these squirrels. So this isn't probably isn't just a, an indication of how good the, uh, the surveyors are in each of these regions. It's probably got much more to do with the environment and the, uh, the density of the squirrel populations in these areas. Um, although, I don't know, maybe it is something to do with the quality of the surveyors. Well, I'll let you be the judge. Uh, but it's interesting how uh, in some areas, the, well, particularly red detection probability is much higher generally. And that's probably fair enough because in these tetrads, red dense population densities are probably much higher. But it is interesting that they change between regions. And this means that maybe comparing the trajectories of naive occupancy, just the detections or non-detections between regions, maybe that isn't um, such a robust way of looking at this data. So it's more of an indication that we do need to account for detection probability because it varies. Um, so what affects detection probability? Well, there's a whole bunch of stuff, and as I say, this is an ongoing analysis, so I just kind of listed a few here. Um, one of the big things that affects detection probability within these feeders is whether or not squirrels have found a feeder yet. So on the first survey, if a, if a red squirrel has been detected, then when you go back the second time, you're much more likely to get a detection. Now, what this means is that if the red squirrels never find a feeder or the gray squirrels never find a feeder, they're much less likely to be detected. So this actually means if you don't get a detection time and time again, we're still not necessarily, it's, it's, it decreases our certainty that these sites actually don't have any red or gray squirrels in them. Lots of other things affect detection probability. Um, the presence, the, the previous detections of pine marten, previous detections of the other species of squirrel. Now this could be some kind of niche partition between the species. It could be that pine marten instills some kind of behavioral change that makes the squirrels more likely to be not to go undetected. Or it could just be that the hair has been stuck on the sticky tape on top of the feeders and uh, the stickiness of the, of the tape is used up and made, it makes it more difficult for following detections to be made. Days of frost, the, the weather in a certain year can impact the uh, likelihood of detecting a species uh, or the availability of food. So masting. So the more, the more masting there is, it appears that the more, the more in years of lots of food availability, lots of uh, high mastings, that it's more difficult to detect reds and greys. This could be because whenever other food sources are available, they may be less likely to go to these feeder boxes. Again, these are all more and more reasons why we need to make some attempt to estimate and account for this imperfect detection process. So uh, what does true occupancy look like? Isn't that a lovely, lovely grainy figure? Anyway, um, well, Generally, um, the, the picture actually does follow up, put the, uh, so this is the naive detect, uh, occupancies over in the red and gray lines, and then the, uh, my estimated true occupancy, which is a much smoother line. 
a good thing or a bad thing. Generally, generally, they're, they're, there's quite a good fit there. Um, there's some instances, tay sides drop down an awful lot and it's naive occupancy, whereas I, I suggest that may not be the case. And perhaps greys may be increasing continuously there. Now, this only goes up to 2018. A lot of people here know a lot more about on the ground about what's going on. So I'd be interested to hear what, what do you think might be going on there. Is Tayside seeing this massive reduction in greys or is it just uh, something to do with the, the detection process that's going on? A big warning call, as we've probably already talked about in, in southern Scotland, where greys are increasing and uh, seem to be continuing to do so. Um, and one of the questions I suppose we all want to know about, does trapping work? Does trapping greys increase extinction probability? Well, yes. And I can say that fairly rigorously now, <laughs> having gone through all this work, but uh, the extinction probability of grey squirrels is a fair bit higher, about 30 to 40 percent, whenever uh, whenever there's trapping being done in a tetrad compared to no trapping being done in a tetrad, where squirrels do still go extinct, but not nearly to the same level. What impacts do grey squirrels have on red squirrels? So once we've got to the truth of whether or not grey squirrels or red squirrels are actually at a site, we can start to ask, do they impact each other? So we see that, we know this, of course, but it's good to have some data behind it, isn't it? Where grey squirrels will impact the extinction of red squirrels. So if grey squirrels are out of sight, reds there are much more likely to go extinct. Um, but also they impact the colonization of sites. So sites that are that are, have red squir grey squirrels in them are much less likely to be colonized by red squirrels. Interestingly, the colonization effect isn't so much in the same year. It's if you see greys persisting on a site for more than two years, that's really where this colonization is slowed down of reds. So if we want to see reds colonize new sites, we need to be focusing our efforts on the periphery of where reds currently are and uh, getting rid of the greys that are on those sites. A bit of the work that I'm particularly interested in comes up next. It's about this idea of connectivity. Um, so how much do immigrants in the surrounding landscape impact our control efforts? How much, how can we quantify the input of neighboring sites to uh, the focal tetrad that we're interested in? Um, so we can think of connectivity really as just the sum of all the immigrants that come from all the other occupied sites in the landscape. And we can say, okay, so it's got something to do with dispersal, this, this idea of individuals leaving where they're born and traveling to a new place to live there. And you can think that the further an individual goes from where it was born, the less likely it is to survive and colonize a new site. Um, we, can, we can estimate this kind of shape using a, a, an average dispersal distance. This, this is a nice curve here, so not too difficult to, to estimate. And the, the, the cool thing is that with just these ones and zeros from this, this spring detection survey, we can actually estimate the shape of this curve. We can estimate how far we expect greys and reds to travel generally, and what impact that has on the colonization and extinction in sites that are elsewhere in the landscape. Because immigrants, obviously, they'll colonize sites that are empty, but they'll also help rescue sites that might go extinct otherwise. And that's what I found for greys, which has been quite interesting. So we see this impact where, where, con where connectivity increases, we do see an increase in the probability that sites are colonized by greys, but much more interestingly, I think, we see this real decrease in the probability that they're going to go extinct. So where we're trapping, where, where trapping is being done to help make the greys go extinct, those trapping efforts are, are much more hindered by greys in the landscape that are within maybe up to 10, 15 kilometers away. And that's obviously why, and that's why this project is so effective, is that we're controlling at a landscape scale. And that's more evidence to support that site-based work just doesn't work. The, whenever you're trying to trap greys out of a site, you really need to be doing it at a large scale across the landscape. That's the, the only way to really reduce the, uh, the, the probability of, actually increase the probability of greys going extinct by reducing that connectivity to sites that are occupied in the landscape. So as I said, this is a, this is a piece of work that is uh, in progress. And uh, maybe at some point in the future, when you have another one of these lovely events, I might be able to come back and give a more polished and uh, streamlined version of this uh, presentation. But until that day, I will just thank you and uh, I'll pass on to the next presenter. Thanks very much.